one of my favorite artists and an artist who's done a lot of amazing albums here, Jackson Brown. Yeah. Describe what Jackson Brown means to you and to the world of music. Jackson's just one of the best cats in the world. His humanity, number one. I mean, he's one of those people that if there's anybody in need or if there's some kind of a fundraiser, he's the guy at the front of the line saying, how can I help? And that, to me, is reflected in his songwriting and his performance. He really lives every moment of his life. Um, the first time, when we did his first album, we did that actually at, at um, Crystal Studio where John Fishback, who I met James Taylor through, I mean, all these things weave around. We did it there. And I, I mentioned it in our documentary. I, when I got called to work with Jackson Brown, I kind of thought he would be a black artist because it was that kind of a, like a Jackson Brown. It's yeah. like a superfly kind of a name. <laughs> and all of a sudden there's this little white guy in the, in the room. I'm going, oh, wow, you're Jackson. Cool. And... But there, here we are, like cutting Doctor My Eyes, you know, and stuff. And this, and I just like, as soon as he started writing Jamaica, say you will. I mean, his songs are so good. He's such a brilliant, Savant. brilliant writer. I've treasured every chance I've ever had to work with Jackson. He's just, he's great people. He's real supportive of the community and and the musicians around him. Those days, there was something about the music scene in that early '70s in this town where. There's a lot of times now where people are real possessive, like they got a record, I don't want to you know, get away from me kind of thing. There, everybody's hanging out with everybody. So you'd go to somebody's house, you'd go to Carol King's house, Jackson would be there, you know, and David Crosby would be there. Mm -hmm. You'd go to Mama Cass's house, and Mama Cass was Russ's sister-in-law, yeah. uh, Russ Kunkel's sister-in-law, and you'd be all these people, Joni Mitchell would be there, and Stephen Still. There was a community here where everybody was sharing. We'd be in the studio with, like, James Taylor, and David Crosby and Graham Nash would just show up at the session, and they'd go, let's do background vocals now and have oh, them sing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like all this kind of plot all my people will call your people kind of stuff and that's was amazing and jackson was like right in the thick of all that and still is he's really a, like a, a gifted artist the only thing i'm really grateful at this point is they finally showed his age <laughs> he's got a gray beard and he's, his hair's got gray and thinning out a bit because he was like this this young kid while everybody else was aging he was like benjamin button or something going in the other direction yeah he's got some really bad uh back issues right now i heard speaking of being brought to tears by music and songwriters uh, i heard him do an acoustic version of these days mm -hmm. about a year ago and he was having a lot of pain in his back and he still did it yeah it was for this uh bob saget thing down the street oh yeah and it was just one an incredible experience, but just the passion he has, and you know, yeah. hearing someone like that sing that song acoustic, and he's oh. great. He's I mean, when we did Running on Empty that tour, it yeah. was unbelievable because here we were going to go on the road playing all new songs, yeah, for an audience that had never heard any of this before, and it was like guerrilla touring at that point. I mean, we just went for it, and we recorded every night. We had the great Greg Ladani yep. engineering it, wow. and. Uh, it was amazing. It's probably one of the best live albums ever because it's really how it went down. There's so many live albums I've heard that actually they finish and then they went and the only thing left live is the audience. <laughs> and they've gone in and tweaked everything and punched in all the horns and all. Jam running on empties as it went down. I mean, it's really an amazing piece of work to I'm me. I'm put that on. What do you remember about being in studio with all uh, Studio One? With Jackson, the production team, the songs. Do you remember anything specific oh, just, about like was, being on The Pretender? Or it like, was all great. You know, I mean, that's the yeah. thing. It's like Jackson's tunes made you want to play, number one. And then the community that we had with, the, you know, the Russ Kunkels and me and all the cats. And when we'd get in there, it was like this kind of like a family picnic getting mm -hmm. together. They'd start a song and everybody would find their way. We'd all weave around for a moment trying to figure out what was going on because no, there was no rehearsals for these. You know, It's not like they're going, we're going to work for a week and then we'll go in the studio. <laughs> I mean, it all went down as it went down and it was, it was always a joyous experience to yeah. be in the studio together. And that would have been a detriment to have a band like that do pre-production because you well, would have wasted so you much. You would have lost the great takes. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I always tell people when I, they when they say, well, we'd like to rehearse beforehand. I go, 
than rehearse in the studio and, and run the machine because it's because what, also what happens is when you rehearse a lot of times you'll go to like some rehearsal hall everybody sets up together and they're all working on the stuff you get used to that sound and all of a sudden you're in a studio and you're in headphones and everybody's and it doesn't have that vibe when you're I, I hate baffles you know, mm-hmm. I, you know I think a lot of that stuff is really there because they don't trust that people aren't going to make mistakes so they want to have everything isolated so they can go in and tweak it but you listen to some of the greatest records ever made and there was almost no baffling in the room there was stuff and if you could iso tracks you'd be hearing leakage from all over but that leakage also creates the vibe of that sound sure and um and so with that i always say whatever you can do record it if you're going to do it because there's going to be something that's going to happen that ain't going to happen when we get in the studio to do it yep. and uh I, I love that part of it you know this show started because uh, eddie van halen passed and yeah. i was like i want to interview ted templeman and don landy which i've spoke to don landy and ted templeman and they've both confirmed that they would do this and i'm just sitting here waiting yeah um i I really want them to come in. Not to put you on the spot, Ted and Don, but... You know, Don called me out of the blue and just said, Drew, I love the show. I'll do it, but I want Ted to do it with me. I said, "Uh, yes, amazing. Tell me when. But it started with just about Van Halen. I wanted to investigate Van Halen because Eddie had passed, and they came in here and did their original demos, you know. Yeah. So did you... Do you remember seeing Eddie here at all back in the... No, I don't think... I mean, the closest I ever got 